Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Sonics. This is episode 181 with Joe Gilder. I had a great chat with Joe and we talked about so many things, including getting started at Sweetwater as a sales rep, creating value for clients. We talk about working efficiently, how he streamlines making great video content, being fast and in the flow while recording and producing, getting it right at the source. We talk about how stock plugins act as a guardrail for him, top-down mixing, his approach to tracking guitars, collecting ideas to stem creativity, He also talks about how it's okay to have imposter syndrome and we can do hard things and everything in between. We really covered a lot of ground here. This is a great chat. I really love what Joe's doing. So here's my chat with Joe Gilder coming up right here on Secret Sonics. Hey everyone, if you're a music studio professional who wants to build deeper relationships with better clients, former guest of the show, Carl Bonner, has created some free educational resources for you. The link is in the show notes below, so go check it out. You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. Hello, and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Joe Gilder. Joe is a musician, songwriter, and producer living in the Nashville area. He's also the owner of Home Studio Corner. I found Joe years ago. Actually, it was like the first blog I ever found when I got started on my production journey. And yeah, I loved his style. Always been a fan. And uh, recently saw that you became the content creator for The Recording Revolution. And I reached out, invited you on the show, which you've graciously agreed to do. So with all that to say, welcome to Secret Sonics, Joe. It's my pleasure. Super glad to be here. Thanks, Ben. Absolutely. So I'm sure you've told a bit of your origin story before over the countless YouTube videos and <laughs> other podcasts uh-huh. and stuff. But give us, a, you know, it could be TLDR or however much you want to share yeah. about, you know, your origin story, how you got started doing the thing you're doing. Yeah. So I... I grew up in a fairly musical family and picked up a guitar in my teenage years, taught myself to play, wanted to be a rock star, uh, discovered recording and audio kind of by accident, and ended up going to school for production. I didn't really know what it was <laughs> yet. I just thought it sounded cool and uh, knew next to nothing going in. I had recorded some stuff at home on my, you know, my parents' old computer and like, it was awful, but um, fell in love. I wanted to just be a rock star and then fell in love with the technical side being on the other side of the glass. I f- didn't realize how creative and fun it was and still is. Um, and so that kind of led me down just further and further down that path of I, I still producing my own music, but also just loving that whole production process. So after college, I worked at Sweetwater Sound for a few years selling gear and then I kind of as a side creative outlet started Home Studio Corner as just a place to kind of share stuff that I had learned about recording and audio and how to record and mix and all that. All the questions I would get from customers on the phone that I couldn't take two hours to answer. I figured I'd do some videos and post it online. So that was 2009 mm-hmm. and it's just kind of been chugging along ever since. So it's been it's been a wild ride, but I'm I really enjoy it and it's been a lot of fun. That's amazing. Has there was there like any aha moments along that journey, or I guess towards the beginning that said like, oh, this is this is it? What what was like that thing? I mean, I remember, v- like I was hanging out at some friend, like in high school, hanging out at a friend's house, and he had installed this software. It was just, it was like Cakewalk Guitar Tracks or something. It was an eight track mm. recording software, but he showed it to me that you could record on different different tracks and mul- just basic multi track recording, and I was just completely mesmerized like they all went to like play games and watch a movie and i was just at his computer the rest of the night just messing with it so that really i mean that just i I tend to get obsessed about things and really into things for seasons but that was one that went deep and tied into i already liked music and enjoyed playing and songwriting and all that so it just i just I, i was telling somebody the other day i i still get goosebumps when like that moment when a song comes together like it doesn't get old like i it just you'd think after doing it so many times that it would be old hat, but I still just get so excited about it. So I'm just gonna keep doing it as long as it keeps yeah. exciting me. And um I mean I've I've had lots of lots of fads come and go, like things that I've been interested in that go by the wayside, but music and production has never been one of them. So I'm gonna keep rolling with it. So you stay you stay you're staying motivated. <laughs> 
yeah. Amazing. W- were there any mentors along your journey? Like anybody that kind of helped point you in any directions? The, I had a f- uh, couple professors in college that were super helpful. I just, like I said, I, I came into learning about production knowing nothing. Like I, I'm jealous of like high school kids these days who have like, Oh my gosh. Way, they're Everything. Way, yeah. They're way better than I probably am now. Um, and they're, you know, they're just kids and it just comes so easy. So it's like even watching my 12 year old son, like he just can figure out like video editing just intuitively, like stuff that it's just fun to see. But I had a professor who he was just, just a good guy and taught really well. And he kind of, he had worked at Sweetwater and kind of turned me onto that idea. And so that kind of, which led to Sweetwater led me to feel to kind of first time ever doing, it was my first job really, but it was also a sales job. So it was like commission sales. So you had to like, Mm. you know, sell right. stuff. And I loved it. Like, yeah, I know some people would say I would hate that, but for whatever reason that just connected with me, I could like educate people. It lit a fire under your yeah. butt. To... It was the first time I'd felt like that. You know, you talk about kids who like grew up and they were just entrepreneurial from the beginning. That was never me, but this job lit that fire. And I started realizing, man, like, like this, this idea of being kind of, if I can create value for people, it affects my income. That's just a cool dynamic. So doing that and selling things kind of Mm. led me to like, well, what other ways can I create value? Which kind of led to that. So I think it's funny that that kind of, you know, all our journeys are very crooked and there's left turns that you think should have been right turns, but you end up in a place. So like that one professor putting the nugget of an idea of working at Sweetwater really kind of directed a lot kind of where I am now. I don't know where I would be otherwise. Wow. That value thing is also like such an important lesson. Mm -hmm. When you provide value for people, like mm-hmm. things things go well for you. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean that's been like a big a big key to my success. Or you know, I don't I don't know how you measure success, but like what <laughs> the success that I've found in this. If you industry, find out, you let me know. Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> yeah, just like giving value. People that that lets people trust you, mm-hmm. and then they continue to work with you over and over again once yeah. you've built that trust like, through that value. You know, if you can make a lot of money, that's great. But like kind of you can get more de- less like that's the kind of the top level shallow thing. Like I want to do something to make money. But like underneath all that, like, you know, it gets kind of this 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 feeling of like, oh, it's a you shouldn't ask for money. That's a dirty, you know, it's weird. It's awkward. It's whatever. But mm-hmm. like how many how many of us love to buy things? Right. Like I'm looking at like the guitars and that Hoffner bass over there behind you. Like, yeah, <laughs> I bet you loved making that purchase. And people are the same way with with really anything. So I think thinking that terms of value versus how can I get money out of somebody it's just a it's a it's a more satisfying way to approach it and tends to work pretty well too yeah I guess uh got to get out of that that like what's the what's the word when you're when you're afraid of of spending money <laughs> and think about uh-huh. that people actually might want to spend money if it's going to get them something yeah. they want 100 percent. because we all have things that we're we may not be extravagant spenders in lots of areas but there's usually one or two things where people are willing to kind of throw caution to the wind and spend a little bit. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I feel like a lot of people, me included, are afraid of like charging too much money because it's like, oh, they're, you know, they can't afford it or, mm-hmm. you, you know, you, you empathize with the client, uh, you know, the artist and being like, okay, they, it's hard, you know, it's hard to spend money on on music mm-hmm. production or mixing or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but if you're providing a value, something that's so valuable to them, they'll, 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 they'll bend over backwards to, to mm-hmm. pay for it. You know? Yeah. And, and, and especially in a certain, in a kind of a very service oriented business like that, you only have so much time, right? Like you can't, there's only so many hours that you can devote to a project. So at some, at some point you can't, you know, you gotta make enough to support your family. And that probably means, you know, you, you can't take on the, I, mean, I was lit watching something recently. I can't remember what it was, but they were like, you can't cater to broke people for, for as your customers. Like nothing wrong with being broke. Like we've all been there, but like a broke person can't support your business. So that's probably not where you, so we certainly shouldn't cater to them because it's not going to provide enough. In, anyway, I don't know how we got on income. But I don't know either, but no, <laughs> so, but it's, it's a, something yeah. I'm thinking about a lot these days. You know that like, we have two, we have mm-hmm. two kids now. And so things got, yeah. things got real in a very literal sense. And it, and it's yep. like, okay, like if I'm not charging enough money, if I'm a, then I'm not earning enough money, then I'm not doing myself a service because mm-hmm. I'm just going to be out of business. So it's like, what what does the business need to stand up? And it's it's whatever it takes to support my family at this point for me personally. So And if you think of, you know, the idea of I don't have to, I don't have to be for everybody because I'm not going to be like, someone's going to work for you for a number of reasons. Price will be one of them, but also like they go and I was listening to the the reel on your website, like 
I imagine you and I musically would get along because like of the style of like the way the mixes sound. I'm assuming you produce some of those too. Mm -hmm. So like if you were like a super heavy death metal producer, (laughs) which that's not something I play or know very well, we probably wouldn't have as many things in common musically. So like it's just the the money's just one piece of it. And you you only need like we, we only need a handful of customers and clients to be able to right. do what we do and, and make what we need to make. Like it doesn't have to be right. millions. And so like to me, like realizing like I don't have to cater to the lowest common denominator is, is a bit freeing. Yeah. Um, and then I can be maybe almost be a bit more choosy, which feels weird when you're sometimes you're in those spaces of feeling desperate, but like there's, there's Hope, a lot of, hopefully at some point, a lot of people, out hopefully there. at some point that's, that's exactly the point. Yeah. Like there's, there's so mm-hmm. many people making so many different kinds of music and there's no reason why mm-hmm. uh, you can't, cater to exactly the kinds of music you want to make. Uh, my, my buddy mm-hmm. Kyle Bonner, who's been a guest on the show and uh, has done some business coaching for me, has basically said that. Like if you go on Spotify and you just see how many how many different artists there are, it's like, it's crazy. And it, mm-hmm. and, and, and so many, and you, you, you know, you could just list, literally listen to like different artists and see like, oh, this is an artist that I really like, but I think I could actually make better. That's like a perfect candidate mm-hmm. for somebody to reach out to. Or to start connecting with. 100%. Because there, there's mm-hmm. bound to be people that totally vibe with you. And music's so personal. Like whether you're doing it in person or like online collaboration, like it's such a, you're like up in their business, right? Like reading their diary kind of thing when you're working on their music. Oh, so yeah. like, of course, they've got to they've got to feel connected to you and feel in a sense safe with you, but also like they need to vibe with you musically and all those other things too. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is actually, this is super important. Like I, I like to talk about how people, you know, find artists to work with them or how artists choose to work with, mm-hmm. with, with you. And this is like, yeah, like this is exactly that thing, you know, mm-hmm. that personal interpersonal yeah. relationship thing. Amazing. Wait, so these days you're working on your own business, home studio corner, PreSonus, mm-hmm. you're doing videos still mm-hmm. for PreSonus and now all, and all, all like, you know, the music that you're working on yourself and on top of that, now you're starting to do recording revolution videos. How did that happen? Yeah. And and how do you do it all? That's that's like the real question. <laughs> yeah. So if if you're not, I can't imagine anyone listening isn't familiar, but um, the Recording Revolution is the YouTube channel um, that was started by my friend Graham Cochran back in 2009, um, which was the same year I started Home Studio Corner. So we we discovered each other very quickly, and there was about a half a second where he seemed like a competitor. And then I just, I, the next second, I was realized I really liked him. I think he was a good guy. I could tell he was just like we would get along, kind of like, you know, you just vibe with somebody. Mm-hmm. So instead of treating him as competition, we became friends. And I reached out to see if he wanted to do a podcast together. And if he wanted to do, we did lots of other, we like ran a business together, a mixing thing called Dueling Mixes for seven years together and did some in-person events here in Nashville. So it was just a, a cool relationship. Um, but he just... It's a very good business person, and Recording Revolution took off, and he started coaching people in business stuff and stepped away from Recording Revolution doing the day-to-day content. Uh, And that was a couple years ago, and they tried to bring a few different people in to make content that worked okay, but they just couldn't find someone to kind of really take the reins. Um, And then I randomly, end of last year, reached out to him really just to say, hey, we haven't done anything together in a while. Let's do something. And he said, oh, I'm actually working on kind of shutting things down because I really want to focus on this other, this new business. And I said, well, why don't you let me take it over instead of just stopping altogether? Mm. And so that kind of started that conversation. And we just, we eventually kind of worked out a deal for me to kind of just come in and take over. So it's, as we're shooting this, it's very fresh, very new. And I'm not trying to come in and like change everything. I just want to come in and just be a, just continue to do what I've been doing for the last decade of just great content to help people make music. Um, and where, where, however they're doing that in a home studio, but so yeah, it's just another, another place to, to, like we talked about earlier, provide value. Yeah. Um, and the, the lines are so blurred between what I do at home studio corner and recording <laughs> revolution. So was, how those become unblurred, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. We'll find but, out. I guess. I was, yeah. It's kind of like my, my 12 year old loves, are you familiar with the, um, like food theory, game theory, film theory, YouTube I'm channels? I'm familiar with game theory, the concept, but not the, okay. not the YouTube channels. So it's specifically like video game theory, so not even like whatever the the anyway. He, he this is guy who has several different channels that kind of focus on different things. So maybe we'll figure cool. out a way to. I got eight eight years to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. He'll be into it for sure. But your question was like, how do I do it all? It's one of those things. Like on the outside, it probably looks crazy, 
and like I never stop working. But in reality, it's it's not that. I've I've gotten really good at doing a specific s- skill set, and so I can do things like shoot a video like from start to finish in a couple hours, like the whole process, right? So it's not a several day long process for me. It's a pretty quick. I'm just I'm I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to like efficiency. So I love like if I can find a good macro to do something for me that in one step that used to take me four, mm. I'm all over that kind of thing. So that's that's just kind of naturally carried over into the way I do the deliverable of creating content. And it's kind of the same with music, although music obviously needs more time. You can't rush that as much, but there are ways that you can obviously mm-hmm. be efficient when it comes to making music too. So yeah, efficiency is a big part of it. So planning, so I do, a, I'm, I schedule my days my wife actually does it to just kind of make sure I'm hitting all the things I need to do. But it's, yeah, it's just like anything else. I just get efficient and then you set aside time calendar and get it done. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you using like chat, I don't do chat well GPT a, to come up with like site. ideas <laughs> or that's all from the <laughs> noggin. I did. I've got a video coming out. I did ask chat GPT to write a song for me and it was pretty funny. Yeah. It's a very formulaic approach. I was like, write a song about a turtle. And it like the chorus was, oh, Mr. Turtle, something, something, something like it. It made a poem. Um, it's pretty funny. Pretty terrible. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. They, they, there's some things that I, I don't think they're going to catch up on to us so quickly. But when they do, watch out. Yeah, actually. <laughs> Run for the hills. <laughs> yeah, to- no, totally. So efficient, efficiency <laughs> is the name of the game. How many, yeah. how many videos are you shooting a week? As far as like deliverables, there's usually one a week for, for each channel. So that's three for Personas, for Recording Revolution, and Home Studio Corner. And then there's an extra for Personas every few weeks. There's a couple extras for them for different things. Um, but that that's about it. Um, oh, so that- and then a couple of a couple of weekly emails. Um, I do a print newsletter for a membership thing that I do. So like, there's other stuff behind the scenes, but that's the main the main stuff. So that like technically you could knock it out in a day or something. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's crazy. I'm I'm like just getting started with like the video thing. It's so it's so uh-huh. hard for me. I'm like so like there, I'm, there's so much resistance because like like uh, like yeah. make a podcast. Fine, no problem. I'll make a podcast. Mm-hmm. It's audio. It's fine. Mm-hmm. I could deal with that. Once you open up like the visual thing, it's just like I finally figured out how to do like what's it called screen flow. I'm working mm-hmm. on it. Well, well, there's some videos yeah. in the pipeline or ideas of videos. Good, but uh, good. I, but there's resistance. There's such a cool. There's concept. resistance. There's resistance for me. Absolutely, it's a whole different thing. But I I, I was surprised how much I loved the video side of things from a creative, even like editing standpoint, it's pretty fun to like bring kind of the editing sensibilities from audio, but then figure it out. Cause you can't, you can't do it the same way in video. You can't have like the jump cuts. You got to figure out all that stuff, mm. but yeah, it's, it's fun. It comes naturally just like, like you do in the intro of this podcast, we were talking before and you're like, all right, let's do it. And then you go right into, Hey everybody, this is a bit or whatever the right. intro I is. Put right? in the reps you've now. done it a hundred and, yeah, it's just muscle memory at this point. It's the same with all of it for for sure. Yeah, it's like if you do enough of it, eventually they'll get good and you'll get efficient at doing it. <laughs> That's right. It takes a crap load of work to make something seem effortless. Yes. I, I, I have a book behind me. I've mentioned it on a few podcast episodes uh, called Start by John Acuff, I think. Yes. And he's just yeah. like... John Acuff lives in my neighborhood. Oh, okay, cool. So send regards. Isn't that funny? He doesn't know me. No, I've <laughs> not technically met him, but... But uh, yeah, it's a great book. It's just like... If you don't put that first foot forward, you're never gonna get anywhere. So stop thinking mm-hmm. about it and just uh, do do a few reps, right? That is a good good book. Yeah, an important concept. Also, mm-hmm. he also made one called "Finish" that I never read. <laughs> which, <laughs> you never finished it, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of ironic, but nice. I haven't. I didn't even start that one. <laughs> so you're you're ahead of you're ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Wait, so let's talk about a little bit about fish efficiency in the recording studio, because mm-hmm. I know this is something that you, yeah. you harp on a lot. Yeah, like talk to us about w- different ways, maybe some ideas of how you could kind of get get going quickly, finding that creative juice and just starting. Well, I think the, for me, when I think about it, it reminds me of, so I, I talk about how being fast in the studio is important, not just for the sake of being fast, but if you've ever, I was talking about this with my buddy, Lid Shaw, recently um if you've ever been in like a nashville session with a nashville engineer like they're flying it's it's very fast not not like specifically like once the session started and like they're sitting in front of the pro tools rig or whatever there's just a speed there and so when i was learning because i learned pro tools first 
in college. And so when I learned it, a lot of it was about learning the key commands, learning how to do things, how to do things fairly quickly. And I didn't quite get it. But then a few years later, I was a friend of mine, engineer. He's a live sound guy who wanted to kind of up his studio production chops. So he invited mm-hmm. me over to just be the artist, to play guitar and sing um, on something so he could just kind of practice. So I went over and I remember that it was it became painfully aware that he was just really slow at the just the the little things like like for example if 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 I was I did a vocal and I said cool can I um can I go back and double that chorus what I would expect from like if I was in like a Nashville session was like this timing hey can I go back and get that chorus yep one second okay let's go Three, two bars coming into the chorus and then I'm singing so what is that you know six seconds. Um, but with this guy, it was like, Hey, can I do that? And it was like, I could watch him from across the room. I could see over his shoulder. It was like, click on the menu, new track, go, ch-. you know, it was just, it, it took like two minutes. And so is that a big deal? No, the, that, and I'm on a micro level, who cares, but bigger picture over the course of a whole project, that's a lot of time. Yep. But also as a musician, like I just sang it, I'm feeling so good about it. I want to sing it again as a double I'm in the zone, like I'm my 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 diaphragm's still like tight from like ready to sing, yeah. and then I have to just sit there and tap my toes. Right, and you have the pitch like wet, re- ready in your head, you know, like that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's ready, and it just fades. And yep. like, is that the worst thing in the world? Of course not. But that's kind of the there's a there's an element of you know the whole like state of flow thing. Yeah. Um, there's an element of like when I do vocal overdubs or something like the music actually never stops like i rewind punch in like there's always music happening and it keeps me kind of in this cool zone where i'm just i'm singing up mess that up rewind singing like it just goes and goes and has this flow to it um so those are it's more than just on the on the simple level you get fast and efficient at something that means you can do more of it right which helps, right? Especially if you're getting paid by the hour or by the project, you can do more projects if you can do them faster. Um, sure. But then on the back end, as a musician, there's something about being able to stay in that flow and like, hey, it'd be really cool if we put a tambourine on this and you can within 10 seconds have the new track set up and a tambourine ready to go. Yeah. You know, it just it's, it feels really cool. It's like watching, you know, when you watch a great live show. Have you seen, so are you a, a Radiohead fan? Massive, They're my favorite band massive okay. perfect answer yeah so when you, Radiohead, see, you see this smile the smile um i don't know oh uh, yeah 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 yeah. so, I, uh, so yeah, that's another when that's I, a story for after the pod <laughs> when i first tried to get into radiohead i just didn't get it i was like this is weird their time signatures are weird i'm out um but then you know decade later i kind of rediscovered them and they are just delightful but that there's that video, I'm sure you've seen it of them playing the album in rainbows in the basement it's the peak it is it is I mean that album's delightful. Um, it's the one with like the weird fishes song and the yep. the the first the opening song that's in like fifteen fifteen step step yeah fifteen step sequence like crazy. Um, this is, if you this, haven't seen Joe, it, you're, you're like you're in my zone right now. This is this is the, this, <laughs> I told you I thought we had this is this I thought is, we were gonna connect for me musically. in rainbows in the basement is like the peak. Oh my god, it's like the peak of music almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you haven't go, seen it, set aside an hour. Go find it on YouTube. There's a couple of versions. They're high quality. It's well shot, but they're just in the basement, which is, I guess, in California somewhere. Um, there's a little bit of a live audience, but they're just in a big circle and they're playing through the album. And it's really fun to watch. Like, I'm sure there's edits and it wasn't as fluid, but like they go from one song to the next and like, because they do so many different things, like, you know, on one song, dude's playing guitar and then he puts the guitar down and sits down at a synth and or he switches instruments but in the middle of a song. And it's just this, but it's this fluid, the music never stops and it become. they do all these, they're doing like 12 different things as like a six piece band or however many there are. So to me, that's kind of the idea of being in the studio, being able to like pivot and like, especially in the recording phase, like, man, if you can have stuff ready and set up and laid out in such a way where you can quickly move from one thing to the next. It's just really fun. And of course you can have, like I did a project a few years ago where they came down from Pennsylvania and they only had two days to do like a five song EP. So very real sense. We needed to have the vibe and all the fun, but also it just needed to happen pretty quickly. Mm. So all those little time savers really add up over the course of a two day session. Yes, totally. And it's also, I, I find like when I have like a tambourine or a shaker or something ready to go, uh-huh. I'm just like opening a new cha- cha- channel instantly. 
Like it just wows the artists I'm working with, and they're like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> cool." And then they're uh-huh. it just it just that that totally solidifies the trust that you're building with them, and totally and that they'll, then they'll come back again and they'll keep working with mm-hmm. you because of that. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to like the the interpersonal thing, but um, yeah, workflow. <laughs> Any other tips? I mean, and then when it when it comes to like the mixing stuff, and I'm sure y'all have talked about mixing a lot here, like it having a system. And kind of a process really helps because if you from as simple as just like having like a kind of a base template that I set up that I start with, that's the same. Everything's the same color every time. Like a lot of that helps me mix quickly. Probably the biggest efficiency is when I first I think everybody goes through this phase where you get into recording and you just want to mix. Right. You, You see all the cool mixing plugins and videos. So you just speed through the recording process just to get something laid down so you can have fun mixing. And it. And you mess up the recording and you don't make it sound very good. And then you spend all your time trying to fix a bad recording. Yeah. I think people think that's what mixing is. And if you can if you can get over that hump to the part of realizing, oh, the reason my songs aren't sounding as good as I want isn't because I need to get better at mixing. I really need to rewind and get better at the recording thing, both like recording technique and production and all that creative stuff um, that at least for me as a person who loves technology, that the recording part's a lot of work, but like mixing's fun. I get to like bring in the new plugin and try a new routing thing and all those fun things. But if you don't get the first part right, the the mix is you'll always think of mixing as like this big band aid rather than like the really fun creative tool that it is. So that I found the better my recording sound, just raw, the the more fun the mixing process is, of course. But also it goes by pretty quickly. Yeah. Um. I I can sometimes the song is you know forty five minutes and we're pretty much there versus wrestling with a shaker track for three hours because you <laughs> recorded it wrong, right? That, that's an extreme example, but yeah. No, no, that's all, that's awesome. Hey, everyone. If you've made it this far into the episode, then you're probably a fan of podcasts that help your personal development in the music industry. Former guest of the show and fellow podcaster, Travis Ferentz hosts Progressions, a show about finding success in the music business. If you dig Secret Sonics, I have a feeling that you might enjoy his angle too. You can go check it out via the link in the show notes below. So go check it out. All right, back to the episode. And I, I know also you harp on this, uh, getting it right at the source. Um, oh, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe you can harp on it on the podcast here. <laughs> yeah. So I've been saying it for the, the, the actually back to Graham. So we did a podcast together called the Simply Recording Podcast um, that ran for a couple of years. We had 30 or so episodes wasn't nearly as prolific as this one, but we, um, the very first episode was called get it right. The source that was, we were like, how do we start this? We're like, well, that's, that's the way to start it. Um, it's that it's and the idea has evolved over the years. Cause initially I just meant it as, I'm not saying I invented the phrase, but we just, I've just harped on it so much. Originally for me, it just meant record it well, but that's expanded to produce it well. Like you can have a well-recorded boring song, Right. The guitar track sounds good, but it's boring. So, like, there's that element of recording and production being two different things. Um, but then you, if you just keep going up the signal chain, you keep finding other ways to improve the source, like, obviously, equipment and things like that. But the song itself, the performer, maybe this person shouldn't be the one playing guitar on this. Maybe that's the wrong guitar. Maybe that's the wrong chord progression. Maybe those lyrics don't make sense. You just kind of keep rewinding. And there's so many things that constitute the source in my head. And all of those really need to be in place before that first recording session. Or you end up... Because once you record it, you know what it's like. You, You record it and then you live with these things that you've done for weeks and months as you finish the project. So... If you're going to have to live with it, you might as well take a little more time on the front end, making sure it's all right and good. Yeah. Um, because you, then you're just kicking yourself and it becomes a frustrating, frustrating process. Yeah. I feel like there's a, a balance there also, because I feel mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, people have been talking about on the show also about just like, you know, capturing and then an- analyzing later because you don't want to ruin that inspiration mm-hmm. because sometimes you just need to get into it before you forget about it, uh, before you lose that kind of momentum. And so I guess, I guess the balance is making sure that, you're, you're, I don't know, you have good microphones in a good room. I don't know, stuff like that. Think easily accessible. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They, there's there's got to be a, a, that, that balance between get knowing you're going to get it right at the source, but also being open uh-huh. to that like initial burst of inspiration, you know? Yeah. And some of that is just you get to a point where like 
I don't slave over recordings anymore. Like I set up the mics the way I've done it a thousand times mm-hmm. and I just check to make sure it sounds good and then we just go. So it's it's not like it's three hours of A being eight different microphones on the snare, like that kind of obsessive thing. Um, but I think in the beginning there is there needs to be some of that. Um, some of that like like I, I tell the story of when I was still working at Sweetwater and I was working on an album of my own music and I got a couple of microphones, set them up in stereo, and I sat. I set aside a Saturday to record all the guitars for this upcoming thing. So I spent the whole day just knocking out guitars for like ten songs. Really proud of myself. Took like three weeks off, right? Because that's what we do. And came back and listened, and they were all super muddy and boomy. I had just. I was in an apartment, and there were you know noisy kids upstairs, and I was trying to get as close to the mics to minimize noise but I got too close, right? And on the headphones I had, it sounded okay because I was listening in the room and it was the sound of the guitar and everything else and just thinking about a thousand different things and the performance kind of being in that zone, like you mentioned, but I was just too close to the mics. And I ended up spending that whole that whole album fixing those guitars when it probably would have made more sense just to go back and re-record them. And so I think that's the thing. Like you, you do that a couple of times, you realize, oh, this thing I'm doing causes muddy guitars every time. Once I fix that, now, like, that's a mistake I don't make anymore Yeah, because it was such a painful one to live through. But, yeah, I think certainly there's – it's better to capture something than nothing for sure. Um, but I think also to recognize what you can and can't do later using plugins and things like that. Like, yeah. There's only so much they can do. Totally. I think in a, in a way you sort of have to learn those hard lessons at some point mm-hmm. to like, yeah. you know, the one time I, I you know, I moved a, a file to the, the drive in the wrong direction and I erased oh, everything no. I worked on, right? Like, I don't make that oh, mistake gosh. anymore. You know what I mean? Like, that doesn't mm-hmm. happen. But I guess I had to make it once. I literally like have a pit in my stomach when you say that. Yeah. That's such a real, oh man. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's just such a real thing. Like. Wait, what did I just and and it's gone. And that's it. I think you I think you would actually undo it on a Mac. I think you probably could command Z it if you were smart. You probably and could. you realize that you did it on time. But if you've done like a yeah. million things after that, then it's it's uh-huh. then it's too late. Too late to apologize. <laughs> the other day I shot a it was probably like a forty five minute video and I forgot to turn the camera on. <laughs> or I may have stopped I may have not even started rec- no, no, yeah. I forgot to turn the camera on. So it was this, I was like, I nailed it. And then I go and look and there's only audio. <laughs> I was so mad. It's, um, it's time to release it as a podcast, I guess, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and all the parts where I'm like, look at this, look at this. Like, just imagine something's there. It's fine. Yeah. Well, I imagine the second time you did it, though, you did it faster and even even better. Yeah. When that does happen, I tend to, the second time tends to go a little better. So yeah, I guess it's fine. Yeah, you see, we got, they're, they're, should be. We have to make these. Mis- should be grateful. We have to make these mistakes, Blah, right? <laughs> In life, there's no control Z, though. That's the problem. Command Z. <laughs> that's true. Look at that. Yeah, <laughs> that's a T-shirt right there. Yeah, that maybe. <laughs> let's let's talk about that after. <laughs> that's your big. That's the big break for both of us. Is the Command Z T-shirt? The Command Z. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Wait, so I know you used to be a big believer in stock plugins. You know, mm-hmm. simple over complicated. Is that still the case? Has anything changed for you over the years? What are your thoughts? Not much. Um, so it started off, I mean, it's kind of a shtick. Like, you don't need all the cool, fancy plugins to get good sounds because it's at the end of the day, it's just EQ, compression, stuff like that. But it just, I think for me, it's it's more about just simplicity and not overcomplicating things than it really is about the sound itself. Um, like for example, I used to use just the stock EQ and compressor in studio one, just to, almost on principle. Um, and then they came out with these, they had these other ones that were like emulations of analog stuff. And I resisted going to it cause I just, I was kind of stuck in my ways. But then when I finally did, I realized, oh, okay, these, these sound pretty good. And so then I have buddies who are like, well, you have to try the UAD stuff because that's going to sound even better. And I kind of stop myself just because it's it. I know myself and I would just go down an endless rabbit trail of A being compressor after compressor after compressor and possibly not making any music in the meantime. Um, so for me, it's almost just a kind of a self-regulating, like I just use what's there. And if I don't like the way it sounds, I've got lots of options just within what's included in Studio One, which is a lot. 
and I just kind of live with that limitation because I think we all need guardrails. Some people need more, some people need less. But I remember when I worked at Sweetwater, most at the time, at least all the software companies would give you all their plugins as a sales guy. So you, you, they would just dump them all on your iLock and you could have whatever you wanted. And it, it was smart because if you used it, you're more likely to sell it. It made sense. Um, I think I still have a bunch of those licenses on my one of my iLock accounts. But um, I remember going to a friend's house and just playing around in his studio and he went to put a, an EQ on a track and the menu like filled up the screen because he had installed all of them. And it was like <laughs> 90 EQs to choose from. And I just think... Yeah, like, that's crazy. Decision fatigue. Like, yes. I've got to come in here because what I would end up doing is just find the one that I like or two, and those would be all I would end up using probably anyway because by the time I'd A-B eight or nine of them, I'd be so sick of whatever I was listening to or it's all subjective or, you know, like one's a little louder than the other, so that's going to make it sound better, but was it really better? Like those, I just don't have interest in that, in those things. I'm much more interested in, I'm probably more in my head a producer than like a mix engineer or any kind of engineer. Um, Cause I'd just much rather make something that sounds cool than like, you remember back when this is probably 10, 20 years ago that you could buy these CDs of like the ultimate blind split tests of like, they'd put like 70 microphones on a single source <laughs> and you could get all the files. You could hear all of these famous microphones on the same thing. And it's just like, I don't care. Yeah. That's just, is there is there, are there better things out there than what I use? Probably. Am I making stuff that I'm proud of? Yeah. So at some point there's like what's the point? Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally for me at least. I totally feel that. And I get I got carried away with, you know, I was like there was a there was a plugin I wanted to buy from Plugin Alliance. And they had uh-huh. like, you know, buy two, get one three. And then here you are uh-huh. and you're like, oh, well, I got to get the third one, you know? <laughs> so which one do I choose? Yeah. And then you're like deliberating over like plugins you don't need just so, you know, you, you get the, you get the right third plugin to, uh-huh. to get that, that, that bonus. And I, as I was doing it, I was like, this is really stupid. Like, I don't need either of these plugins that I'm debating between. So just choose one and, and, and move on. Or don't do it. Maybe it would be the smarter thing to do. But at the same yeah. time, we all have our things. Like I've got probably more guitars than I need, right? Right. I probably only need one or two to get the jobs done. But I have more than that. And like I get into things like I went through a phase where I was really into pencils. And I got into like black wing pencils, which are like 25 bucks for a box of 12. Which on the one hand, you think, wow, that's really expensive for a pencil. And you're like, but it's only 25 bucks. Like, mm. like I what can you get for 25 bucks? So it's just something that I enjoy. They're really nice. They smell nice, whatever. So like we, we all have things. So if, if you get a lot of joy out of buying a plugin, go for it. Wonderful. But if you've complained to me that you're not releasing any music, but you've bought three plugin bundles in the last three months, then I'm going to Bur- probably yeah, break I'm gonna push back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, there's definitely a, the right balance for everybody, but it, you, mm-hmm. I, I think that your outlook of like knowing, first of all, knowing yourself and, and what's right for you, what's wrong for you is, is super important. And also to not get carried away with, yeah, the stuff that you don't necessarily need. You, you, you know what, you know what works best for you. But I did, I did a couple of years ago get the FabFilter Pro L2 limiter because the stock limiter in Studio One, I realized I just couldn't do as much with it as I wanted to. It kind of would get crunchy if you pushed it too hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my my masters were coming out quieter than I really would like. Um, I don't want to go crazy loud, but I tested it out and I was like, goodness, you can, this is dangerous because you can just push anything into that thing and it sounds great always. So actually anytime I'm doing a video now, everything I do in video runs through that before it gets recorded. How do you set it up for your videos that it's also, that's working like instantaneously? Yeah, so I use, this is where we can get a little techie. So I use uh, Audio Hijack from Rogue Amoeba. It's a little standalone app that basically lets you put in little blocks of modules. So I have like my input, which is a, a mix on my mixer down here, a separate, a dedicated mix. And then I can have a block for a plugin, which I use for Pro L2. And then that gets sent off to Loopback, which is then what I use as my audio source for mm. recording video. Got which it. It sounds more complicated than it is. It's really fairly simple, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the stuff that people do to make things work for them, right? <laughs> it's funny like it's it really is like thinking about all the different i'm sure you've had some of this all the different iterations of ways to capture audio and video and and get it all to work it's it's funny some of the like i had this cheap little mixer like four channel mixer and i was running stuff i ran my vocal through like a use the insert out to like a gate 
like one of those old out where is it that's over here the like that old 3630 Alesis mm. like compressor gate just because I, I didn't want I wanted my voice to be quiet when I wasn't talking but then it sounded weird and it sounded like I was gasping for air every time I took a breath because it's not that great of a gate <laughs> um like we just so many so many iterations of how can I make this work better so this is the current one that's working pretty well so I'm gonna stick with it nice how do you I, I noticed that you were like, um, this is so like inside baseball, but I noticed that you're like, <laughs> you're, uh, you know, you're, you're listening through monitors and talking into the microphone yes. during the screen. How does that not get, how does that get like not become a big problem? That is, that was, that's, that's a good inside baseball question. So this is like um, what I'm thinking if, about right now. <laughs> of course. I mean, this this, uh, that's, I would be, I would be wondering too. Like I can't sleep until I know how this works. Um, so I use the Personas Studio Live digital mixer is kind of my, it's sitting in front of me. So it's a digital mixer, USB to the computer. So it's where everything comes through here. So my my mic is coming through here, obviously, and my playback from whatever software is coming through there. You're coming through there. Um, but then, because what I wanted to do was be able to, I don't love doing videos with headphones on. A, because I get tired of wearing headphones. But B, I'd like to hear through my monitors, especially if I was doing like a mixing video. I'm, that's where I would mix. So it would feel weird to, mix it on headphones just for the sake of video when I would actually be mixing it on my speakers. So I finally figured out, oh, if I just, basically I solo the tracks that I want to go out to the speakers and I have, it's, now that I'm trying to explain it, I realize it's more complicated than I thought it was. Um, <laughs> so the solo bus on the mixer is what feeds the speakers. But then the actual mix on the board is what feeds the computer. So the only difference between those is the vocal mic is not soloed and going to the speaker. So it's the kind of solo that doesn't mute everything. It just like selects them. It's like the, anyway, it's a certain type of solo mode. Um, so now like my DAW playback, my computer playback, your playback is going out the speakers, but my mic isn't. And then I've got a mix on the board that includes my mic that gets recorded into Studio One, wow, or into whatever the whatever the software is I'm recording. Is there like, a, but is there a t is there also a ton of bleed into the microphone when you're when you're doing that? Good question. So then, while I'm shooting videos, I've got my thumb on the mute button for that microphone. Oh, genius! So when I go to play something, I go to play. You know, right hand hits space bar, left hand hits the mute button on the microphone, so the mic is muted. Um, now, there's other ways you could do it. You could have the mic recorded to a separate track, and you could go manually mute it out. Right, that but that sounds um, I'm, super tedious. I mean, all I got to do is go boink with my thumb and I got it good. So um, simple is the best. It works well. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's one of the reasons why I can't, I, I, I don't think I could ever not have a physical mixer in front of me. If nothing else, just for the content part, because like that workflow has probably saved me countless hours of post-production and editing and headaches and all that stuff that I don't want to deal with. Yeah. You got it. You're the streamlined guy. You got it all. You got it all set up. <laughs> Mr. Streamline, yeah, sick. That's me. So speaking of uh, of Streamline, let's talk about mixing. I know that you, yeah, you. Uh, I don't know if you, this is still what you're doing because I'm I'm like super behind on your videos because life just got crazy for me. How oh, dare you? I know. What did you have a baby or something? Yeah, like exactly that kind of thing. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so 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 you. Uh, I know you used to do what you call top down mixing. So starting from like the stereo bus, uh -huh. moving down. Is that still what you're doing? Has anything changed? whatever yeah so it's it's evolved a little bit over the years but so that kind of the current iteration is i use a template so that my mixes if you were to pull up any of my mixes over the last several years they would all look visually very similar so like the drums are always blue there's a bus for the drums there's a folder for the drums it's all kind of organized in a certain way so that's so that helps me just be consistent from one to the next i don't have to search for a certain weird track because i even if you send me tracks i'm going to put them into my system in my set up and it's going to feel like something I, I would be familiar with. And then, uh, then the static mix is still the all important step two. So just getting levels and panning figured out before I start reaching for plugins. Cause that's big mistake people make. They want to start slapping stuff on there and fixing a problem that might've been better fixed by just adjusting the balance between things. Um, so getting the static mix and then Fixing any major problems is kind of the newest piece of the puzzle. So like if there's a bass part that's just super muddy or a guitar part that's got too much low end or the vocals jumping out certain spots that's just annoying me during the static mix, I'll fix those things first. Um, if there's like a ring in the snare drum, that kind of thing. Then I start the top down process, which is not so much starting at the mix bus anymore as just 
mixing kind of each group of tracks independently. So like listen to the drums, put stuff on the drum bus first. It's kind of a game I play with myself. It's kind of like the um, name that tune game. Mm-hmm. Like I can name that tune in four notes. I can mix that drum track in two plugins is kind of the goal. If I can get it sounding great with an EQ and a compressor on the drum bus without sacrificing anything, then that's like a win for me. So it's kind of that game. And I do that on the bus level first for each group of tracks. And then I go in and do stuff on the individual tracks as needed. So yeah, the top down thing I still do more so on the bus level. I usually save the mix bus till later Mm. once I've kind of figured out and fixed some of those problems and gotten things kind of more reined in. Then yeah, I'll start doing the mix bus processing. Interesting. Are you still like stereo bus compressing, or are you kind of leaving that for the groups? Um, yeah, I do. I do still, unless I forget, which <laughs> which sometimes happens. Um, I'm still compressing. I, I do. I try to do most of my compression on the buses, and then I usually have some sort of SSL type compressor on the main mix bus. Just kissing it. It's not doing much, but it does that weird. There's a little thing it does in the low end that I can't. I'm not exactly sure what it is. If it's like a internal side chain that it does or something but even if it's not really moving the needle too much that those ssl style compressors like there's just a there's just an extra oomph in that low end that's just not there without it so I, I reach for that almost every time but that it's it's not doing too much the bulk of it's happening on the buses and then some stuff on the individual channels if i need it yeah Totally. Makes sense. I'm like, uh, I- I'm like personally trying to think how I can do less stereo bus processing and it's so hard to change, change my ways because I'm so used to it. But I like I, a lot of people that, I mean, I'm not anywhere close to thinking about working in Atmos, but people that are working in Atmos oh, are yeah. talking about like deliverables. And so it's like, okay, yeah. the, the stems need to really add up to the exact same thing as the mix. And so, right. so that's kind of totally jacks you up if you do everything on a mix bus, right? Yes, exactly. So the, uh, so I'm like trying to think about like this. And, and there was a, there was a guy in my show named Tim O'Sullivan. You should check him out. Um, okay. and he, uh, and he was like saying like, listen, if you, if you're, if, if you end up like figuring out how to not mix into a stereo bus, your mixes will inevitably get better because you're, you're like treating like the, you know, like kind of like getting it right at the source, I guess, if you, if you know what I mean, mm-hmm. like getting it further down the chain. And so as opposed to like relying on it as a clutch or uh, not a clutch, a crutch. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to change your ways when you've been mixing into SSL compressors yeah. for, for. God knows how many years, right? Because then you could think, okay, do I just put that on every bus? Because it's not going to be the same. Right. It doesn't. But it'll, but it'll, but it'll be similar-ish, but then it's not going to react the same way. Then you're like, do I put it on every bus and trigger it from the mix bus, like a, like a, like a sidechain thing, so that it behaves the same way, but it's on the individual buses, but that's still not going to be the same. That's interesting. I was at Sweetwater sometime last year and they've got an Atmos studio like a stupid expensive Atmos room um, it was the first time I'd listened to an Atmos and it was fascinating but the first thing I thought was okay this is totally different because like like even if like either my drum mix is going to be there but if I'm putting overheads back here and toms are spread around like that takes out that takes out so much of what we would do right even on a drum bus because like so much of the sound of like what I like to do is the sound of the drums hitting a drum bus compressor yep because it just does some cool magical stuff. And so yep. it's just a whole different thing. But then maybe you would just leave them up front stereo and move guitars and stuff around. I don't know what would be the best way to do it. But it's interesting to think about. Yeah. I mean, I think what we like about, st- I think there's something about stereo that we really like and, or have at least grown to like that I don't think is as possible mm-hmm. with Atmos, which is I think mm-hmm. how the low end hits with yeah. in that kind of like compact thing. Mm-hmm. And that's what we've been like, audio engineers have been doing for so many decades uh-huh. and have gotten very good at. And so like, it's a very yeah. different, it's just a totally different approach. And so trying to like have that in mind while you're mixing stereo is super weird and uh, counterintuitive. Uh, it is. Cause even thinking about mastering, cause the loudness is way like their standards are way quieter for Atmos. Right. right? I think it's like six, minus then, 16 like, t- or something like some. Yeah. So then like e- you can't even rely on like, because sometimes the limiter comes in and saves the day and kind of does that final piece to put everything together like it needs to be. So then you can't rely on... That's interesting. Yeah. So, I don't know. Stuff I've been thinking. I've been thinking. Maybe we've thinking. been doing it wrong and we're screwed. 
I don't know. Nah, I don't think. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't. know. We'll see what happens with it. Maybe it's just hype. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? With it. I actually haven't heard. I, mean, I haven't heard an Atmos room yet. So it's pretty incredible. It's it's because I, I was in this in the boat of like, okay, it's just surround sound, mm-hmm. but it's it isn't. It isn't because there's like a depth to it that's not like I got the. So I, I was in the Atmos room, then I bought like the AirPod Pros so I could experience it on the headphones thing, which is obviously not. It's a little there, but it's it's interesting, especially the part where you turn it on where if the vocal's up in front and I turn my head to the right, he stays up here, so mm-hmm. he goes to my left ear. Right. Um, that's interesting, but I guess more so for like VR than for music. Like I don't really care if the stinger stays in the same place, but yeah, I don't know. It, it made me, it, it was definitely like an, a more immersive feel. But then like when's the last time I listened to a surround sound mix of something? I don't know. You know, I can't, it probably would feel close to the same, but anyway. Yeah. I get that it's a different technology because it, it can, li- it can figure out what speakers you have set up and kind of recalibrate itself. Exactly. Yeah. To that, that's pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, I don't Down to, I mean, down to know. mono apparently, but. <laughs> apparently. I, I, listen, I'm down not, to I'm, a little Amazon, you know, hockey puck that is at most enabled i'm like what why are we doing this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but man the labels are shelling out big money to remix everything in atmos so yeah somebody's betting the farm on it well i, I mean i spoke with bobby osinski on the show and he was telling me that um the labels have a lot of incentive to do it because it's a way to kind of like renew their publishing on on some of these classic records that uh, so there's it's it's not sense. it's not just uh you know i don't know i don't know what the what 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 i'm trying to say but you know what I'm trying to say. It's not just yeah. it's not just the the audio format. It's it's more than that. It's it's a it's more of a. But they're definitely putting some money behind it, which is yeah so interesting. Yeah, but I'm sticking to stereo until I I I'm I can't <laughs> I can't do anything about it or I or I somehow yeah. or I somehow believe in it, which would have to I'd have to hear a room first, <laughs> which hasn't happened yet. So well, that's we'll get so being in the personas world, we get we don't have Atmos yet in Studio One, mm. Atmos support, and people just. That's their number one complaint every time we release a new feature. It's like, why don't you have Atmos? And I want to say, like, do you already have your seven speakers set up? Did you go spend thousands of dollars on your seven speaker Atmos rig? Yeah, the 14 speakers. Because if not, what do you, 14 speaker app? Like, what do you care otherwise? Like, you know, like I get there's probably a handful that have, but most of them are just, just want to complain. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, no, totally. No, it's, uh, we'll see what happens. Time will tell. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, in, in terms of mixing and, and, and production and, and your workflow and all that stuff, are you mixing as you go? Are you mixing afterwards as like a separate process? How does that work for you specifically? Good question. I actually just did a video, just put it out. It's called like, should you mix as you go? So I, I've, it's top of mind. Um, so I kind of go two ways. If it becomes a distraction and like you, you like get lost in the mix as you go thing, then I'd probably say ease up and just get, cause I used to think let's finish the recording process and then let's mix. And the lines have blurred to the point where I really do see the value in doing some mixing as you go. Partly just to get it. Cause like the drummer wants to hear it going through a drum bus, right? Yeah. When we play back just in the room the same day. And I want to know is, how's it going to work if I throw some mixing on it make sure it's, you know, I'm not getting any weirdness out of it. Um, but also what's really cool I think is, and, and I just kind of realized this the other day that like mixing as you go gives you a chance to like try out new stuff without any pressure. So if you have a new plug-in bundle or you want to try a new vocal mixing technique or something, you can mess around with that on a rough mix of a thing that you're in the middle of working on without any like dire consequences. And so you can kind of, well, I wonder what like we're doing pre-production for like the EP. And so I grab like this the Personas PD70 microphone, so you can't see it, but it looks like a kind of like an SM7, but it's like 130 bucks. I th- I'd liked it, but I was like, I wonder if I'd like it on like all the lead vocals. So like during pre-production, I sang through this just to see what it felt like, mm-hmm. and then later ended up using it on the final vocals. But that's kind of in the same ballpark of ideas of if you mix as you go, then it gives you like an extra chance to mess around with stuff, and then decide does that work? Do I want to keep that for the final? And you can always delete it all and start over again right. if you want it's like an extra um, inspiration nugget kind of thing yeah and if once you get and it's hard because it depends on where you are if you're just learning how to mix it probably makes more sense to just separate the two um because you're it's just a lot to kind of take on at once but if you're feeling pretty comfortable in mixing then suddenly like i've had projects where we get done with the recording and i'm thinking 
I mean, this is kind of mixed already. Like I'll tweak a little bit, but it's kind of already there, which back to efficiency, why not? Like if I can get it there before I even mix it, that's great. We can just print it and call it a day. Yeah, totally. Do you, is it like the same template for, you know, production and mixing or is they, are they separate templates, templates for you? It is usually the same. So usually it, it has all those. So my template's real simple. Like there's, there's not like plug-in settings per se. It's just, I've got the buses and the folders for the big groups and they've each got a plug-in on there with like the compressor and EQ that I like on those, but bypass. So it's just kind of there waiting for me. Kind of almost like a little like eight channel console or something with like my favorite compressors on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's what I start, whether I'm mixing or like producing something. Um, so I'll start with that and put all the tracks into that. And then usually if it's like an album project, I'll save a new template after we do the first song mm-hmm. with all the tracks in place for that, just to start the next song, um, make it a little easier. But yeah, it all kind of, it all originally nates from that kind of core template. Got it. Amazing. Well, well, one thing that I noticed that you you do really well is guitars. I don't, maybe you could walk us through a little bit of it, your approach to tracking guitars, whether it's acoustic or, mm-hmm. or electric. Or- yeah. So acoustic's probably the, if there's one thing I've recorded the most, it's either acoustic guitar or my vocals. So I've just spent a lot, a lot of time with it. Um, for me, it's, first of all, two, no two guitars are the same. So like I had a Taylor 314 I still have it, but that I, I recorded for years and got to where it was the one that I did the muddy recordings at first and had to like learn how to re-record it. The next album, they sounded great, but that first one killed me. Um, but then um, I bought a Gibson J45, which if you know those two, like they couldn't be more different. The Taylor's nice and bright and crisp, but still full. But then the Gibson's like kind of moody, and bluesy and almost dull sounding, but in a cool way. Um, and none of my like old tricks worked on the the Gibson. I would set the mics up the exact same way I would do on the Taylor, and it would just be okay. And like in the room, I'm thinking this thing sounds amazing. It's like my spirit guitar. But then what was coming out of the headphones and coming out of the speakers when I recorded it wasn't. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it took me a while. I was actually sitting down. I might have been shooting a video. I can't remember. Had a single mic in front of me. You know, pointed at the twelfth fret from about eight twelve inches away, like the normal thing I would do. And I just didn't like the sound. And I turned to like look at something on my computer. So I turned to my right. And I was just strumming the guitar while I looked over there. And it immediately in the headphones, it sounded amazing. And I looked and the microphone was like way down here by my hand, like on the seventh fret or something, pointing back towards the sound hole. Mm. So I was just rotated to where it was, instead of being in front of the guitar, it was kind of up here aimed down towards the neck or towards the sound hole or where the neck meets the body Mm -hmm. and that sounded incredible on that guitar but when it was when i rotated back you know a quarter turn to the left it didn't sound as good so that to me was a big aha moment of okay all right i see what you're doing here guitars you're a bunch of jerks (laughs) and you're gonna make me work for it so a part of it is you gotta especially with acoustic instruments you gotta just each one kind of wants its own thing so have have a few extra tricks up your sleeve to try but it's easy because you just move the mic around and then listen but make sure you listen on speakers before you sit down and record eight songs because you might regret it. <laughs> the speaker will tell you real quick if you messed it up. Um, so that's my that's my big lesson for acoustic guitar. And I've lately, last few years, I've been really doing a lot of XY stereo recording. Mm. And I found, this is going to sound dumb, but when I do XY, I use a pair of those Earthworks SR25s. They were in that drum mic kit that they used to sell. I don't know if they still do. Mm. The whole shtick was like you can record drums with three microphones. But I like them for overheads, but also for acoustic guitars. They're like super transparent but, sounding, right? If I- mm-hmm. Yeah, they're just real chill. And and they're small and they're cute. But I'll do it. I, I found that, especially with fingerstyle guitar, if I put them in XY where like the the – if like there's an axis in the middle – like it, one's pointing left, one's pointing right. It's like the 45 degree angle if they're at like 90 degrees. I was told there'd be no math, but we're getting there. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I would, I would point the, I would point that part directly at the sound hole of the guitar. So like one mic is shooting up the neck sort of, and one mic's kind of shooting down towards the bridge, and the sound hole's in the middle, which on paper sounds like the dumbest idea ever, because the sound hole is just a big mud box, right? Like right. It's, if you point the mic at the sound hole, generally that sounds bad. But since they were both pointing to either side, it's, I started off doing it with an f- acoustic EP I was working on with a lot of fingerstyle guitar. It sounded incredible. Because when you do stereo guitar, what do you end up with most of the time? 
you end up with a lopsided sound, right? Mm -hmm. There's one that's pointed towards the body that gets most of the volume because it's so beefy. Mm -hmm. So you end up with, you have to either rebalance it or you you just get used to turning your head to the side when you listen to that guitar because it's left heavy. So I thought, well, if the if the if the if the, lo, the big volumes coming out of the sound hole, if I can put a mic kind of one going up, one going down, and like move my body to get it right in the position where it feels balanced in my headphones, I wonder if that would sound good. And it turns out it sounded really good. I have to get the mics fairly close, so there's that there's that fine line of it's too boomy or not. Mm. But once I find that right spot and a little bit of a high pass filter. It was just beautiful. Are they cardioid um, mics so or are they or are they like Yeah, they're cardioid. Mm-hmm. I think they're just regular cardioid. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're small diaphragms, so you can get them right next to each other so you don't have to, have to worry about phase stuff. And XY is not super wide. Like it's not as wide as like a space pair or something sure. like that when you listen. Mm-hmm. But man, just that little bit of width that it gives, especially like if it would be a song where like it drops down to just one guitar after the chorus or something. And that one guitar just has this beautiful just slight width to it that sounds like you're sitting in front of the guitar it's just it's just different right like the first time you ever did something in stereo and you were your mind was blown you know what i mean yeah yeah it feels kind of like that doing it so now i've started almost always doing my acoustics that way even if i don't plan to really use it stereo like that i like having that kind of in my back pocket Mm. um so you'll keep like one side sometimes oh you'll Mm -hmm. you'll just make it mono or i'll just sum it to mono and got it throw it to the left or the right um i like having that option but yeah, that's been a that's been a killer setup. Okay, for guitar. sweet. I, I've I've done the X Y guitar thing. I haven't done it in a while. I've been kind of doing like one and one, you know, just doubling things up a lot, uh-huh. which is fun also. But I'm gonna try it again. I, I I lent my my pencil condensers to a friend of mine. I, I so I so rarely use them now, uh, but maybe maybe gotta get them back. <laughs> yeah, I go through phases. They they stay in the. They stay in the case for a while, and then they come out and get a lot of use. Then they're, they're good. They're in in the case for two years, and now for three years. You know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a good. That's a good system. Amazing. Wait, it's, it's, and tell me about uh, tracking electrics. Yeah, so I've I've been on a journey with electric. Um, Where because well, I like the people I, are about to hear some guitars in, in the sauce segment, so they, they could just yeah get, yeah 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 they could just get so that whole up for that. the song segment is from my band Stare Down, our first EP. Uh, that we wrote together. Um, all those guitars are the... So I'm being connected with Personas. Personas was purchased by Fender at the end of last year. Oh. So now wow. we're a part of Fender, um, which means I was able to get deals on guitars. So I bought a... Um, I only bought one, so I'm pretty proud of myself. I bought a Chris Shiflett Signature Telecaster Deluxe. Which, if you're not familiar with it, it's the Tele Deluxe is a Tele with two humbuckers, mm-hmm. so it feels more like a Les Paul or a 335, which I feel like is more like my spirit guitar on the electric side. But it's got these custom pickups that are just nasty and dark, um, mm. and I like the two when they, I like it. It's got the four knobs, so two volume knobs, one for each pickup and tone knobs for each. I like that setup, cool. kind of like a Les Paul, where you can flip between the two and have one loud, one quiet. That kind of I just like that vibe, like I. Yeah, it I'll gives sit you, down and watch Jimmy Page do that thing. Yeah, it gives you more control. The classic Telecaster like, is simple, right? Yeah, exactly. And then having control over each pickup, I can I can dial in a ton of sounds with just the knobs, which is fun. And so then, but then it was that guitar and primarily is the main guitar. And then I used the Helix for the rest or for all the amps. So it was mainly the Helix, one of the Marshall models, um, set fairly just fairly normal standard and then a few few plug in effects or a few pedal effects in there but in the past I've got like a Fender Deluxe reverb that I've used a bunch I've used the Avid 11 rack which is still in my rack and literally like I don't even know where the power cord is anymore but <laughs> I use that on a few albums but it just looks cool and it's orange and I don't have anything to put in that space anyway so um so I've used I've kind of gone back and forth of using models and then using um I don't like soft I don't like the software models just because I don't want to have to monitor through the software. Since I record everything through a mixer, I monitor everything off the mixer directly. So yeah. like drums, bass, guitar, like it's all just right there. If I use an amp modeler software that kind of messes up my whole workflow because totally. I monitor through the software. Yeah, totally. Um, I, got, I have to say like, I, I have to say like just on that point, I'll let you continue in a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the but that Neural DSP Corey Wong app is insane. It's so good, but it eats up, first of all, it eats up a ton of CPU. And then, oh, yeah. and then you got to deal with all the monitoring, you know, and then I record bass, it's yeah. just direct, you know, it's no problem, but mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I got no latency, That's... but 
it, it, it's fine. I got an M1 uh, Mac, so things are things are better now than they used yeah, to be. Yeah, the M1s can handle it, it for sure. But, that was kind of my when I first started recording guitar electric. Seriously, I was rocking a pretty old iMac at the time, so having like the 11 rack and just XLR into yep. the mixer is just nice. Like it's just I treat it like an amp, yeah. and it gives me the option of it, 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 a lot of people fall into the trap of well, if I used a plug in, then I can change it after the fact. And right. then you just never stop changing it. Like final mix, you go in and tweak the low gain yep. on the yep. amp, and that messes up the whole thing, and you end up just ruining things. So I would rather, yes. even if it's an amp modeler, like my Helix is just plugged in XLR into the mixer, and I just record it in. Um, I don't record dry signal and then reamp it. I just I like to back myself into a corner creatively, and I can always go back and re-record it if I need to. Yeah. Um, I think that when, um, when I do that's smart. when I do use the amp, it's the Fender Deluxe Reverb with like a Cascade Fathead ribbon, just right in the middle of the cone, which is normally too bright. But those ribbons are so dark, and the co- the combination of the two feels pretty cool. Um, and I like that a lot. But it's a real amp, and the tubes are starting to get old and doing that thing where they sound like they're about to explode. <laughs> so <laughs> the Helix never the tubes never go bad on the Helix, which is nice. Yeah, no, totally. I, for, first of all, I totally resonate with. Uh, you know, backing yourself into a corner because I feel mm-hmm. like so, so many people are just always covering their butts to try to like, you know, maybe I'll need to do this later. So let me just record it like that. And then you end up recording. And this is kind of like what Vance Powell talks about a lot is like, you're, then mm-hmm. you're just not recording safe. You know, you're recording too sla- safely and then it becomes kind of mm-hmm. banal and boring. And, and, uh, and so like, I've, I've know I've, I've been, you know, I've swung in either direction, but uh, sure. I'm, I'm trying now to swing in the, <laughs> in the more like, this is the, you know, yeah. This is the sound. There's that level of of being like taking a chance and like almost like jazz improv. Like I'm not going to play this, you know, I'm going to play this song a different way than I've ever played it before, and mm-hmm. it's risky. Um, but there's also like this like this idea of decision fatigue. Like we have to make so many decisions over the course of writing, producing, mixing, releasing a song that I would love to take some of those decisions off the table. Um, rather than procrastinate or push them down the road a little bit. So that's a part of it for me is I just, I don't want to have the option to even have to go back and make changes to it. Um, because I've, you know, mixing is a thousand decisions an hour. I I don't want to add more onto that kind of already big to-do list because I get easily overwhelmed just in general. If I have too much going on, I need to kind of like reset. So anytime I can make the music part simple, like here's what you do next, there's really no other option that it works well for me. Yeah, I love that. And it's also limitations. Limitations lead to creativity. Like if, if you have oh, yeah. endless opportunity to do stuff, then you're going to just do nothing. And if you, you know, you know, I've had a bunch of bunch of guests also talk about this. of just like, you know, mm-hmm. when you limit the scope of things you can choose or whatever. And like, it's like, it's like the plugin thing for you also, yeah. you know, then you're, you're just like, oh, th- these are the tools I have, or this is, you know, this is a guitar tone I have. So what am I going to do with it? You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Rather than. It's like, you mentioned Vance Powell, like I've I've never met him, but like I, I love all like the Jack White stuff and like yeah. Jack White's shtick for a long time is I would play with a crappy plastic guitar because I don't want it to sound good and I want to have to fight it during the show because like making it intentionally hard on himself and he goes probably too far in that direction to where it's like okay I it's okay to have your guitar in tune but um, <laughs> but I do like that idea of like I'm gonna back myself into these creative corners and see what happens it's it's a, it's a cool it's a cool social experiment. And we've all known those people who have like amazing collections of guitars or amps or gear, but they're terrible at playing. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, of course. <laughs> and not, not to say that, that you can't have a lot of gear and be good. Um, but we don't want to be like gear collectors who never get good at any of the things we own. Yeah, either. totally. What Vance told, told me on the show, uh, was that the reason why Jack kept working with him was cause he was fast. Cause he didn't, mm. he didn't, it wasn't because he di- brought, you know, I'm sure he did bring a lot of things to the table gear wise or whatever, but, but, <laughs> yeah. but he, but he, you know, it was just like, you're ready to record. Oh, here you go. Here's a channel. You know what I mean? Like he didn't waste mm-hmm. any, any time once that creative spark was, was lit, you know, so to speak. Yeah. And I don't imagine Jack would be the kind of guy who's like, Hey, Hey buddy. Um, I didn't really get that recorded. Well, can we do another one? I'm sure he's like, what? Yeah. Like I came in, I recorded, it should be recorded. Yeah. They're probably just zooming through those sessions. Oh, that'd be fun to be flying a wall for that kind of stuff. It might happen. It might happen yet, and maybe they'll put it on on YouTube or something. I don't know, <laughs> or not. Oh, oh, do you have some insider information? No, I don't have any insider information. No, oh, no, no. fine. No stocks were no stocks are being traded. You know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> amazing. All right. So, so yeah, we've we've got, we've got to a lot of stuff here. Maybe, maybe let's head over to the soft segment. We could we, we'll get a little deeper after that, and so people can kind of yeah. hear hear what you're talking about. So you sent me a track called "Keep Your Distance" by Stare Down, which is as you mentioned your band. Let's have a listen to, to that for about ninety seconds, and we'll chat about it. Sound cool? Cool. Yeah, Joe, it sounds awesome. I I love the low end on this one, and there's like this nice grit to the bass, um, mm-hmm. kind of like passing it in between notes, and it's got that really cool synth part, which really adds a lot. Uh-huh. I think that that adds a ton to the song, honestly. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, tell me a little bit about this song. How did how did it come together? Yeah, so this was this whole project was guys that I've played music with forever. So it's just me, uh, drummer Tim Horsley, bass player Joel Bazaire. Um, they've played on my stuff for years, but we've never written like together. So this was kind of the first kind of truly collaborative effort. And um, this was one that I had written a chorus for um, and kind of had a rough idea of a verse. And so we would just get together in a room with instruments and just, you know, just get together and write, which it seemed it, it's something like it was it actually happened, it came to came to be during COVID and lockdown and just watched the Beatles documentary oh and my got really, it was like, I need to be in a room with musicians. We may not be the Beatles, but I need to, I need that in my life. So we eventually got together um, and just did, we just wanted to jam and see what happens. And so we eventually songs came out of it, which tends to happen. So, um, but yeah, this one was, it was just real simple. So like the chorus is almost like a Beatlesy kind of a chord progression. It's like the one, one dominant seven, four, and then this kind of a chromatic walk back up to one. So like it, it, it even though it's heavier guitars, it kind of has that kind of Beatlesy vibe. So the drummer was like, I'm going to kind of make it feel a little bit like the Beatles as I play. And the bass player, we never, ever record clean bass, and it makes me so happy. He's got a mm. bigger pedal board than I do for <laughs> bass, um, which is just great. Um, so nice. he's always, it's always at least gritty if not like straight up like some like synth like muse distortion kind of thing on there um <laughs> but yeah the this one was in it was of the ones we recorded like on that tracking day this was the one that I was the most like oh um they just had this thickness cuz he's the intro is he's playing toms and snare yes the bass is just chugging i'm just palm muting yep just a b power chord and just trying to keep it like trying to keep as much space in there as you can, which is so hard to do, especially as a guitar player. I just want to overplay. Right. And there were so many times where like um when you get into that verse two and there's that this little melodic line kind of happening underneath the verse, I wanted to play so many more notes. Like I can't. I'm not like a shredder, but I would they would be like, What if you played this? And I would play like a few extra ones. And they were like, what if you didn't do that? And you just played these simple notes. And it, it seems like by itself, it sounds so stupid simple. 
Like I wanted to do these little like that kind of thing, but it made more sense for it to just be more straight and to kind of blend in the background with everything else. Because then mm. we ended up doubling that part with a, like a little synth reverby thing, um, which made more sense that they were just very simple notes going back and forth. So it was a lot of that kind of being in a room, just creating together. What do you think about that? Yeah, no. Okay, let's move on. And we had that from a relational standpoint because we've made music forever. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. And we kind of set at the outset said, hey, we're going to all throw out ideas and there are going to be bad ones and there are going to be good ones. This is a safe space to have bad ideas, yeah. um, which you may think doesn't need to be said. But like it's ironic because like the drummer, his name's Tim Horsley. I've known him for a dozen years or more. Um, he was the he was the touring drummer for Keith Urban back in like the 99, 2000 when he was blowing up. Um, there's videos of him playing these massive arenas. He played with Gary Allen. He played with Dina Carter, a bunch of country artists. Um, so he's played like stadiums, but like he was nervous in the room with me and Joel, like throwing out like lyric ideas. Mm. And so it's just an interesting insight into like, like music is such a vulnerable thing. Like whatever, wherever you find yourself in that, whether you're the producer or you're the engineer or you're the artist or all of the above, like there's so, yeah. like, it's just funny to think about, you could be a sick, you know, everybody's got their insecurities, but it was just, to me, it was really interesting to see like, oh yeah, there's, there's some vulnerability here. So being able to say, let's just throw out ideas and we'll ignore the ones we don't like, or it'd be like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather do this than that. It, it ended up making for a better project overall. Right. Cause my default is usually what I go with. Like the first idea I have is probably what I'm going to do if it's just me in a room. But if there's two other dudes that kind of need to nod their heads in approval, then we end up usually coming up with something better overall. Right. Yeah. It gives it that kind of, that synergistic effect and also that kind of fil mm -hmm. the filter, you know? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Amazing. What, what, um, what was that synth? Uh, I, I don't know if you remember what synth was used on that, but it was, it was, it, there was something, it was, something about it was special. It has like a, uh -huh. it's like an evocative sound. Yeah, so the we recorded the bass tracks, like drums, bass, a couple guitars, and then we knew we wanted... The whole EP has a little bit of synths throughout, um, and a couple of them was a, like literally this Pittsburgh modular synthesizer that the drummer has. It has like the like the bunch of different patch cables and oscillators and stuff. Um, so on like the first song, you hear that... That's that synth plugged into my mixer. Um but then for these songs like this one, it was I just opened up a, the virtual instrument in Studio One and just kind of cycled through some sounds. And then the bass player, I played the part, and he comes in and just messes with the settings for a while, like trying different oscillators or different patches and just kind of tweaking it. So I honestly don't know what he did. <laughs> he just kind of kept jacking with it until it sounded cool. Um, Sick. So yeah, that was it. Was it was the I can't remember the name of it. The main sampler in Studio One. Um, cool. I should know this, but yeah, it's good. It was, it's good. It was it's good pitch for for Studio One. Um, yeah, yeah. There you go. Amazing. And um, I guess what, what I don't know a specific bass. I don't know what what kind of bass to, to, was he using for this kind of. Yeah. So he plays. He had a new bass that he was really excited about, but he didn't use it because he's got this Reverend five string. Um, do you know Reverend basses at all? I didn't know until he got them, but they are glorious. But it's just got this growly kind of output by itself. Um, and then he ran through his pedal board, which always had something going on. And then we recorded to his, he's got one of those little Ampeg mini stacks. Have you seen them? They're, they're like adorable. It's like a little head that's about as wide as like a MacBook and then speakers about the same with like tens. And so it's cute. It looks amazing, but it's like literally like looks like a toy almost. But the thing will crank and sounds really cool. It's not super, super loud, but it's still an Ampeg and it has that grit too. Um, so the bass is that, I mean, we may have done the bass just direct, but I know we've done bass where we recorded through that, but that was the main signal path. Yeah. Um, awesome. I, I love that. I don't think I did a lot to it after the fact. The, what's it called? The Plugin Alliance SVT, uh, simulator yes. is amazing. Uh -huh. And I, I'm, I'm, there's just, there's yeah, something about it. Mm -hmm. and it. It depends on the, there's like basically two tones you can get out of it, but like they're both, uh -huh. they're both so workable and usable and amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Amazing. I mean, the one thing that I, I mentioned to you before we even started recording was that I wasn't sure if you were singing because I've heard you sing before. I've heard like, you know, some of your music, but it didn't sound like you, uh, but apparently you're the, you're the vocalist. What, 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 cha me. what changed? 
I think, honestly, it was getting out of my comfort zone because a lot of the a lot of the songs, like I didn't have the originating idea. And so like Tim would bring a song and would bring a melody idea. And it would usually be like his would always come in way too high. But then we would just get used to it and then I would sing it. And so I'd have to like figure out this falsetto thing that I don't do a lot because it's, you know, it's hard to pull off consistently. Um, enter lots of Radiohead. Um, cause that's like all Tom York does is sing high and falsetto and it's delightful. Yeah. But, um, it, it was, I think a lot of it was having, it's just different music and not coming from me exclusively. It brought out like a different kind of a singer in me, I guess. That's awesome. Um, cause it wasn't stuff that I'm used to. Like I, like I, I talk about like my, I think my resting tempo is like 85 BPM. Like you sit me down with a guitar, I'm going to play 85 and that's it. And it's going to be a lovely singer songwriter demo. And that's as good as it's going to get. So being with like, and and granted that song, keep your distance is probably not far from that, but (laughs) having, being able to do more up tempo stuff and just have more energy and just different voices speaking into it, it ended up being something that I just kind of surprised me that it became what it did. Um, because it wasn't like I just kind of the melody just kind of came like either they came with the melody or I would come up with the melody while we were rehearsing and we would all say, wow, that's special and just record it and move on. So I, a lot of it, and I, I know I would hate this if I was listening when people say, oh, it just kind of came to me, but a lot of that, it just does. Like you get in this, you give yourself yeah. an environment for things to come to you yep. and sometimes they do. And it's frustrating because you can't really say, well, I got this from here, but Right. Um, People like to talk about how the sometimes. how these ideas kind of permeate the world, and if we're mm-hmm. if we're primed to catch those ideas, we catch them. I don't uh-huh. know. I'm like I just I read like I don't know ten pages ten pages of the new Rick Rubin book, and he was talking about that. I was like, hey, didn't Big Magic talk about this also? Like the same that same kind of concept. <laughs> you know, yeah. these are you know it's it's obviously very new agey, so <laughs> you know who knows? But yeah, yeah, yeah. But. I, there, there may, maybe there's truth What's in that. What's the name of his new book? I don't think I knew it was that. I, I don't even remember. I think it's like uh, the creative, the creative the state. Act. Yeah, the creative act. That's it. Okay. Yeah, check it out. Let's check it out. Where the, yeah, it's a cool looking book. It's got nice. It's got a nice cover on it. So even if you don't read it, it looks nice on the coffee table. So <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> Adding to the list. Amazing. Wait, and you sang this vocals uh, through a dynamic mic. You mentioned right. Yeah. So um, being the in the you know firmly in the personas camp last year the year before they released a dynamic mic called the pd70 which looks a lot like an sm7 um but at like a third of the price and so i was immediately skeptical because i love the sm7 um but when i got it and i started singing with it i was like dang it actually sounds really good so when we were doing the the, just the scratch tracks, I would use that mic. I used it and I liked it so much. I just went with it for the final ones. Cause a part of it is it's got the big like pop filter on the front. So it just, just singing into that just felt more like a live environment, which kind of felt appropriate for. Yeah. Kind of rock these music. Songs. Yeah. 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 Like I, I felt like I was performing it versus like behind a condenser mic with a pop filter and all that. So, um, and I knew I was going to like distort it and all that stuff after the fact anyway. So, or throw it through like slapback delay. So like purity wasn't really on the table. Um, so yeah, it just, it had a feel that felt good. So I just ran with it. There's something about dynamic mics that just work better sometimes for mm-hmm. this kind of rock mm-hmm. stuff. There's less, there's less information, but it's like the right information. You know what I mean? Yeah. 100%. Cause like there's this, like, especially singing that loud on some of the stuff, like the consonants are going to be louder. And so they're going to, it just doesn't get picked up quite as, quite the same way on a dynamic so like i can when i once i compress it and eq it it start it just feels more n- like it needs to be it yeah. sounded like i wanted it to sound sooner yes like just with the mic and the exactly. headphones I was like well that's pretty close to what i want yeah um I just, which is why like if, if you're if you're new to all the vocal stuff like have a dynamic and a condenser at least totally totally every song might call for a different one like you can hear ben's voice on that is that an re20 yep mm-hmm. like it's just glorious i'm sure you can imagine situations where that's the per like that hole in rainbows in the basement thing why do you think i bought this as my first dynamic he microphone? He, he is <laughs> oh my gosh he for, first time he comes in they've got a little tasty little reverb on his voice and he just sounds incredible yeah, yeah. 
So anyway, yeah, dynamics are no slouch. And you've heard plenty of the stories, you know, Michael Jackson with the SM7 and Bono with the 57, whether it's true or not, but... (laughs) <laughs> who knows <laughs> they're not they're not less than they're just different tools for it's sure it's different tools I when I, w- I was thinking of, when I was starting to get into audio I, was, I thought about going to school and I, I spoke with this guy at uh, the school in Tel Aviv here in Israel and he was telling me like the difference between condensers and dynamics which is kind of stuck with me like I don't know if it's exactly the right analogy but he was kind of saying was like, uh-huh. like a condenser microphone is like a piece of marble that hasn't been carved out yet and a dynamic is like oh. the, it's already been kind of carved out and kind of already have your shape so like the condenser you can kind of do almost anything with uh-huh. But it's it's all there, <laughs> you know. It's all mm-hmm. and uh, with the dynamic, it's kind of already on the way to whatever it is that you need it to be. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I like it. I think about that sometimes. It's, it's totally true because, like, and then, then there's. I remember when I worked at Sweetwater, blue microphones was just starting to get pretty big. Mm-hmm. Maybe not just starting, but I I didn't know about them. Mm. But they sent somebody out to do some training, and they were saying like. Their whole most microphone companies are like, look how flat response our microphones are. Uh, look at our frequency diagrams, blah blah blah. But they came in and said, hey, our mics have a sound. Like they are tuned, they are not flat because they're tuned for certain applications and they like give you a sound. And like that, they just leaned into that, which is kind of like what you're saying with a dynamic. Like a dynamic is not flat for sure, um, but it's cool. Yeah, and like ribbons even more so because they're like some of them they roll off a bunch of lo- of high end, but then it kind of works really well on bright stuff. So, yeah, I like I I don't be afraid of things that add color on the way in. I'm all for that. Epic, same. <laughs> I need to I need to get more mics, but or maybe not. But let's, we'll save that discussion for another time. Uh, amazing, <laughs> awesome. So yeah, I mean we've 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 covered so many things. I guess let's let's head towards as we I guess head towards the end of the interview. I like to ask people, you know, some sort of different questions. Um, mm-hmm. So creativity, you know, and having energy to do the stuff you do. You know, we all have days where, uh, you know, we're super pumped to get in do our thing, and there's days where we're a little bit less motivated. Uh, do you have any habits, routines, or just like practices to get like in the zone? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for me, um, having a, d- something new that I'm actually working on is when I'm do- like specifically with content, because there's a lot of like making a video is not that unlike making a song. There's preparation, there's the actual shooting of it, and there's the fixing it later, like the editing and all that. <laughs> um, for me, it really helps to, if I come in to shoot a video, if I already have it planned out. Um, if I already know what the video is going to be about, better yet, if I have like a script or an outline done so that when it's time to sit down and do it, I'm not starting from a blank slate because to to sit down and come up with the idea and then do the idea, that's a lot. That's like two big things that need to be done. It'd be nice if there's just one thing to do when I come in to do that. So, um, from a creativity, like music standpoint, Mm -hmm. like having a whole you know a whole dropbox folder full of like random ideas if i need to like write songs is way more interesting and exciting than if i come in and i got nothing um not to say that doesn't happen for sure but i think um it's kind of a circular reasoning cuz i'm saying like the best way to be creative is to already have been creative but um <laughs> but, but there's a little bit of truth to that like you know having kind of always capturing some ideas so that you have ideas to capture. There was a guy I followed who's did a lot of writing and he was talking about like business and writing and all that. But he said like, never start from a blank page, like always have stuff to pull from. So when you sit down to work on, to make something new, you maybe have a, you know, like a, like a folder full of ideas or a thing of just some place to pull from. So then you can take that thing and then build on top of it. And I think that's a lot easier to wrap our heads around than a completely blank slate where we have to start everything from scratch. Mm. So it's about kind of just continuously being creative. It's kind of like you have to always be c- collecting ideas, putting them on the side somewhere, and then and then sitting when you sit down, have a look. Yeah, and I'm not the kind of guy who like I have to write a song every day or like I have a songwriting process. I I sit down to write like when it's time to do an EP, but I don't. But then in the meantime, like between kind of writing sprints um i'll try to have an instrument handy and come up with some stuff and if i find one that's like hey that's cool i'll just record a quick snippet of it so i've got that in the files for when i need it next yeah that's fun because maybe it's you know four months before i ever listen to it again it's like a whole new it's like a new discovery like oh man i forgot about that yeah that's cool let's build on it 
Cool. It's. I feel like uh, I don't know why I thought about this, but the what's his name Brian Eno has those cards that they they <laughs> they prompt yeah, yeah, yeah. ideas, and uh-huh. it, it's kind of like okay, if you have no ideas, then here's a prompt. You know what I mean? So, yep. So we're 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 we, we and it also kind of goes back to like the limitations thing and how we can't mm-hmm. have endless opportun you know potentials and stuff, mm-hmm. and we have to like you know those limitations lead to creativity and absolutely and the fact that. Yeah, we're just humans. Our brains can only handle so much. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> although the AI in the worst case, is just, not doing a great in the worst job, case, it, just but. put yourself in a room with somebody else or on a Zoom call or something. Because that might be best case, actually. <laughs> mm, yeah, depends if you're an introvert or not. But um, <laughs> which I am. But but yeah, like like it 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 being in a room with those guys, the band, we ended up just we almost couldn't help but come up with songs. It was really cool versus having to sit and just crank it out myself. Nice. So what's it like to be in a band now? I mean, we're only a, we're like a recording band. Like we don't ever play anywhere, but it's fun. Like we just met and jammed out like two weeks ago and we've got like kind of two songs in kind of like the 40% completion range. So like, it's just fun because we, they just kind of come out of nowhere sometimes and it sounds like us and it's a good kind of therapeutic output for all of us too. Um, so yeah, I, I dig it. It's it's cool to get into a band when you're older because I feel like when you're, I mean, like I'm like I'm you know I'm in my th- mid thirties, but like you know when you're in your when you're in like your twenties and stuff, you're just like mm-hmm. there's just way too much like ego and it, it's it's oh, yeah. it's much harder to kind of like compromise and find common ground or or be okay with your ideas shot down <laughs> and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the ego is so fragile. Yeah, when you're when you're young, for sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, and I had a another. I guess I, I was thinking. Uh, after I moved on to the post mixing, post uh, sauce segment thing about about reverb, is there any? Uh, what did you do for the reverb on some of those vocals that were really big in that um, in mm. in that sauce segment? So sorry for cutting coming back around. No, that's great. Um, so I use some of the bigger reverb. So it's all the stock reverb in Studio One. Um, there's a we've got a, like a reverb, like a convolution IR reverb thing in studio one and i bought like a pack of like spring reverbs and it came with like 40 impulse responses i'm like i didn't know there are that many different spring reverbs in the world but cool um so that's on there a little bit i think in spots but the main one is this just big plate reverb that i use it's the it's actually the room reverb plugin in studio one it's got a flat plate preset that i think is literally like the 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 plugin shows you like the dimensions of whatever room you're look you're using mm-hmm. and it just shows it as a like a thin plate like they <laughs> set the dimensions of the room to like one inch thick <laughs> and i think that's how they emulate a plate which i guess that's fair um but it just gives this like eternal like it's got like a six or seven second decay time on it so it's this big massive long de- reverb or just decay time there's no really early reflections um and i love to just bring that in not super high but just to let it kind of just like decay forever it becomes like another instrument in the band sometimes it's too much but if you put like a if you roll off a bunch of the low end it tends to work pretty well so there was that and there was probably some delays too amazing Uh, someone was saying that like if there's like a lot of reverb in 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 the in the in the mix then it's it's almost like one of the elements of the mix and so you have to kind of keep that in mind when you're like thinking about masking and you're thinking about like Mm -hmm. what's what's being highlighted because if there's too much reverb that could just uh you know that could be instead of a guitar or or you know overheads Mm -hmm. or something you know yeah, it's reverb has made like quite the comeback. Yeah. It was like we we got too much in the 80s and then we kind of we retreated for a decade or so, but now it feels like I feel like I hear so much reverb and stuff and I'm all, I'm here for it. I'm yeah, like, totally. I actually noticed in the mix uh that we listened to that the drums were pretty dry compared to everything else, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was intentional, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, cuz we recorded them in this room, so it's a just a bonus room over the garage so it's not a huge space um but this one especially so he we wanted it to be massive because it's a three-piece band and he brought this ginormous like 24 inch kick drum like (laughs) just i I don't know much about drums but that thing was huge um and it took us a while to find the tone but once we did we're like okay let's just leave it and go and one of the things we did that helps with getting that thickness and we had, was put a ribbon, like a cheap ribbon mic with the Cascade Fathead right over the kick drum, like the top of the kick drum, like pointed, mm. we call it the crotch mic. It point literally like at the drummer's crotch. And so it gets like a little bit of kick, a little bit of snare, not much cymbals. And it's just that in the middle of everything else in the mix. It's just this 
massive amount of thickness that's just glorious. Um, but yeah, I was kind of wanting a very dry, thick vibe, and that, that's kind of what we got. Amazing. Epic. Awesome. So yeah, so so moving on to towards the end of the show, I guess uh, somehow we're here. Um, <laughs> um, so so we, made we made it. That's good. Um, so, <laughs> so ask everybody who's been on the show this question. So I'll ask you as well. Um, like, you know, looking back on your journey, was there something that you did or maybe you didn't do that you'd want to impart on the listener who's maybe more at the beginning of their journey of be like, Joe, keep at that. That's going to, that's going to be the thing that gets you where you want to go. Or Joe, mm. stop doing that. It's, it's holding you back. <laughs> what be that one, that one thing? Stay away from the cannoli. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, um, I would say like, realize that like the fear and the insecurity and the imposter syndrome or whatever you want to call it that you feel is super normal. Um, it's, it's a part of the process. Like one of the things we feel like we're teaching our kids right now, they're 12 and nine and nine with twins. Um, <laughs> is like, we, we can do, we can do hard things like that. Things are difficult and that's normal. This is kind of the way life goes. Like things are going to be difficult. Be prepared for that. It, doesn't make it any less difficult to know that it's going to be difficult, but there's an element of normalizing. Like I feel terrified to put this out there because someone might hate it and might say something mean to me. Yes, that might happen. Um, but it's worth it anyway. Um, probably worse than someone saying something bad is you put out a piece of music and nobody says anything and you get crickets back. That sucks, but I would rather have made the music than not. I think there's a lot of times in, when I think back of like times in my life where there may be, I don't feel like like regrets the right word, but where I wish things had gone differently is usually I've got some fear and I'm holding back and kind of retreating from whatever it mm. is, whether it's just relationships, um, you know, retreating from engaging my wife well, because that's threatening from a personal level. Cause like you let, let somebody in and then the, you can disappoint them or whatever. Like there's a lot of that deeply ingrained, I'm sure in all of us, but I would say even I know people who have won like awards, award winning, successful, creative people who still like one guy in particular, like he's still he told me when he's finishing up a record it, before he can send it to like he will stall sending it to the label, like major label, because like this could be the one where they finally find out like I'm a fraud and I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And so if this guy. Yeah who's like sending mixes off to Chris Lord Algae to mix. Like if he feels that, why do I feel like I shouldn't feel some of those things too? Like, I think it's just part where if you're a creative person, we tend to feel things pretty strongly yeah. <laughs> out of the gate, yeah. which means right. those terrible things are just going to hit us pretty hard. And that's okay. Um, I think we should still do the thing. Yeah. Anyway, there's a, um, do you know, do you know, Chris, uh, Jason Isbell? Is the artist. The artist, yeah. It's like a country yeah, a country singer? Kinda, yeah. He's very country, but it's more it's like Americana. More like indie kind of stuff. Yeah, Americana. But he um he's got a song that says the chorus is just be afraid, be very afraid, but do it anyway. Mm. And I love that. Because he's not saying, Hey, you shouldn't be afraid. Because I feel like that's like what like my parents' generation was like, Oh, don't be afraid. <laughs> oh, don't be upset. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm both. I'm both afraid and upset. Now what? Um Instead, he's like, yeah, of course, be afraid, but then do it anyway. Because like courage isn't the absence of fear. It's kind of what you do when you're with it. And yeah, and we're all Mm -hmm. afraid and that's okay. Yeah, man, that's, 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 (laughs) that's, that's that's deep stuff there. I'm I'm thinking about it. Let us pray. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. (laughs) I just got to finish with my sermon. (laughs) Yeah, but no, but it's like uh, the insecurity thing, the imposter syndrome, we all, we all deal Mm -hmm. with it. and it. And it's kind of like. It's almost reassuring because it means we're we're, we're still con, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, you, we're real people. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it ha- means you care. It means you care. Yes, that's a big deal. Yeah, you don't lose that. And I think also, like, I, I'm sure a lot of us, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm only talking for me, but you know, there's definitely some people pleasing elements in, in what I do, and and uh, and, and you want to make sure that people are happy, and so that mm-hmm. that's a big part of the kind of like the imposter syndrome is like, oh, sure. if they think I'm a fraud, then I'm never gonna, you know, I'm never gonna do this again, and <laughs> you know, I, I guess I didn't do what I was supposed to do, and yeah, mm-hmm. we can all, we all build these things up in our in our brain, but the more we do the thing, the better, you know. I think somebody on the podcast said this, and I've 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 been thinking about this. Uh, it's just like the more you do it, the less afraid you are. It's like the same thing with like, you know, putting out those videos mm-hmm. on YouTube. Like 
that first couple of videos are probably frightening and then you start to get used to it and then and then eventually uh you're super comfortable with it with this podcast the first yep. i i had crazy imposter syndrome at the beginning and once i <laughs> yeah. inter- once i interviewed a couple heavy hitters like it started to go away you know and and like mm-hmm. once i started like getting more comfortable it, it started going away you know what i mean so it's like yep you know that makes sense you just got to put in those reps and do those things mm-hmm. until uh you realize that the imposter syndrome doesn't matter or you outgrow it or something i'm, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what i'm saying <laughs> something. yeah yeah i get it yeah, deep stuff. Well, Joe, this has been so fun. It's uh, great to meet you in person. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you too. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate you, everything you're doing. People should go check check out your stuff at Home Studio Corner. Uh, anything you want to pitch before uh, before we close it out? No, nah, man, I'm good. We're good. All right, so people yeah, go check out. This was fun. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. People go check out Joe's videos on YouTube. I think uh, I think uh, you've, you've got like the best personality of any of these like uh, video people. So. <laughs> Yeah, definitely go check it out. Any of these video people, I'm going to quote that on my site. You've got the best personality. I don't know. I just connected with you on a on a personality (laughs) level in your videos, and I was like, "Joe's the guy." Thanks. And I, yeah, I'm glad. Absolutely. It took, like you were saying, it took a long time to finally be myself on video, if that makes sense. So, like, yeah, that's it's 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 totally a journey, but that that's good to hear. Yeah, I'm glad. Well, same same here, but on the audio side. But yeah, I yeah, I totally totally feel we're going to get you doing video. It's coming. Ah, we're going to do some stuff. We'll we'll figure it out. (laughs) Anyways, thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate you. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Secret Sonics. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. If you've been digging the show, it would be awesome if you could share this episode or your favorite episode with a friend or two and or leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcatcher of choice. That's it for now. Have a great week. Take care and dig in. See you soon. Bye-bye. 